All right, finally back on the barn build. Uh, the weather's got us chased inside. It's raining, but we're not complaining because it's kind of been a drought up here and hasn't rained in like two, three weeks, or at least a good rain. So the ground's sucking up the moisture and we're inside the barn sucking up the gravy that's in here to complete. You may notice it's a complete cluster mess in here. That's because, you know, it's always more fun to start 10 things at once and finish none of them. But uh, we're gonna try finishing a couple of them today. First thing we're working on, putting some more plywood down on the floor. When we originally built this thing, I put half inch plywood on top of the floor joist on the upstairs here, that's where I'm at. And uh, it just, it had a little too much give to it. My uh, intention always was to put one inch boards on top of it, but now we decided to stick some half inch plywood on top of the other half inch plywood and I'm using liquid nails, some screws, and getting that done. And that'll open up, I think, a variety of options for us. Because if we decide not to go with one inch boards in here, I think this will give us uh, the strength needed where we could even do like a laminate flooring if we so desired. We probably won't, but it, it opens up the option. All right, I'll show you how I stuck this plywood down. All right, first thing we do before we screw the plywood down, we put a little liquid nails down. I don't know if this is required per se, but it gives me a little extra peace of mind. And hopefully when it uh, hardens up, it'll give the floor that much more strength. All right. If I got the right piece here. Lost. Good fit. Kind of tight though, hey. Tight is right. Alright. We gotta grab our special tool inch. Alright, once I get her plopped down on top of the glue, I jam my little screwdriver in there. To Get this gap nice and tight. Then I snap a chalk line where the floor joist is. And then basically what I'm doing is I'm taking two and a half inch screws and I'm running them into where the floor joists are. And then I got some little one and a quarter inch screws that I'm putting uh, in between the floor joists just to suck it to that plywood real good. And once that glue sets, I, I don't think there'll be any issues. It should be rock solid, but that's just how I'm doing it. And I'm putting the screws, you know, probably, ah, uh, probably every about 16 inches, give or take 16 inches. <laughs> no, but probably a foot to 16 inches. So that that's probably overkill, but that's what we're doing. All right, I'll get these uh, screwed down here. Which isn't that exciting, and then I'll take you on to the next part. Alright, so we got the second layer of plywood on. It went uneventful as expected, and it exceeded my expectations. The floor is sturdy as can be, there's no soft spots, no creaks, no noises, nothing, nothing weird, it, exactly the way I want it. So basically it's one sheet going lengthwise, and then another set of sheets going the opposite way. Now, if I could go back in time, I would probably just use three quarter inch tongue and groove and, and do that right from the beginning, but I didn't. So uh, this is what I got and I'm satisfied with the results. Now the mess you see in front of me, I'm doing the soffits. I bought a uh, bead board at Menards. God, I wanna say it was like 24 bucks a sheet, but I'm not 100% certain. It was somewhere around there though. But basically, I'm cutting the beadboard into 21 inch widths, and I'm cutting out a spot for a vent. See, I got one over here. So basically, this vent gets screwed on here, which I didn't buy enough. <laughs> so I'm not screwing these on right now, but I got, got some screwed on. This is my last one, so I was using him as a template to pre-drill the holes. Because it's way easier to put the vent on in here, but I want to get these panels up 
So I'm pre-drilling the holes so when I do put these up, at least I got holes. I don't have to be messing around out on the roof trying to start screws. And then I start screws, I drill holes to mount this up under the roof there. And I start a couple screws and you notice I got these screws painted black. These are just regular uh, outdoor screws. They didn't have any uh, black ones. So I took some of the, the screws I had and I screwed them into some cardboard and I spray painted them so the top was black. So when they're screwed in, they kind of disappear into this black soffit board. Now, did I have to do that? Probably not. The siding will probably come out and hide these. And then uh, fascia trim, I want to say. That might hide the other ones. So I probably didn't need to do it. But I'd hate to look up and see tan screws poking out at me. So this is just a little extra insurance. So what am I attaching them to, you ask? Well, why don't we go out here and I'll show you. All right. If I don't fall off the roof here. All right. Basically, here, here we got her. Now, I took... Uh, my porous quality boards that I cut on the sawmill and I straighten them out and I, by that I mean I I say that they're poor quality but just because a lot of them have bark on but now as I'm looking right now none of these actually do but you'll have to take my word for it the majority of them did so basically what I did first is I screwed these on all right so uh, even with the ends of the rafters and then, let's see, I got it sitting right here. I'll grab the tool. Oh, got a grunt and groan when you reach for stuff where people don't believe you're reaching for it. So I took this fancy high-tech tool and I held it like that. <laughs> and then I went up to, well, right here, it's, it's hitting a little lower. That ain't very good, but whatever. So I went up on the side of the building Till the top was hitting this board and the other end was flat against the side of the house or the side of the barn and then I drew a line on each end and I snapped a chalk line from those lines and that's how this board got placed where it is all right and then after I got that board on on the ends I did a bird box type deal and I am certain there must be easier ways but uh, how I did it, and I couldn't film it because I'm here by myself, and I don't want to fall off this roof. I don't know if you can tell, but it's a little high up here. So basically what I did, I had a scrap piece of two by eight. I trimmed it down so it would go from my line pretty much up to the bottom of the rafter. And I screwed it down to where it had an inch and a half left before it was gonna be even of this right well i should say even with the inside of this that makes more sense because i wanted to screw this board on and have that be even with it so this is set a it's set even with this i'm i'm at a loss for words imagine that so basically to put get the shape of this after i had this screwed on i put a screw in and i <laughs> measured from this edge to the inside of this board and I cut a board that long and I screwed it to the outside using a screw through here and once that screw was holding it for me I drew a pen line on the board and I took it downstairs cut it out put three screws in there one in there and then another one up in here and I called it good all right so that's my bird box. Like I said, I'm certain there's easier ways to do it, but that's how I did it. All right, now these, you're wondering why I got all these. They're actually spaced every four feet. And the reason for those is the span of these soffit boards is 21 inches. So basically I wanted to have a screw mid span where the panels meet just in case there'd be any sag and i don't think there will would would have been but just in case that's what the vents look like i put the vents so they were aimed kind of inward 
right? So if the wind comes, it's not blowing up into there. And then there'll be another board that's gonna go on right here. Look at these nails. Who the heck nailed this plywood on? How do you miss the end one? Come on, man, come on. I went through and I put another nail in there, so don't worry, she's not loose. But uh, yeah, I missed. So basically after I get this board on, I'm gonna trim the edge of this roof so it's flush with the board. And then I got a piece of fascia trim, I believe is how you say it. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. But uh, that'll go on as a piece of metal trim and it'll come down and it'll cover that. And I'll show you when I get that far. But right now I gotta finish screwing these soffit panels up. And then I'm gonna put on the uh, drip edge on the edge of my roof and I have to put new underlayment on. I looked it up and it said the underlayment here was that I got on is only good for 60 days. And I put this on last August or something or September. <laughs> so I'm not even gonna take this off. I'm just gonna put another layer on over the top of it. But before I do that, I'm gonna put my drip edge on because the the new uh, underlayment will go over it and I have the shingles here so I was going to do a metal roof but I procrastinated and they do not have the parts in stock and I don't want to wait I have this week off for vacation and there is a roof going to go on this thing I cannot wait any longer all right I'll get the rest of these soft panels on and take you along for the next part well, I made her to the roof, and I kind of got to get her done today because tomorrow's supposed to be in the 90s, and there ain't no way this cat's going to be up on the roof in the 90s. Basically, you can see I got the underlayment down, and I use cap staples, and for that, I use this Stinger cap stapler. It's like a hammer stapler I bought at Menards. Uh, the things work flawlessly, and staplers have fought with me my entire life, but this one has, has worked great. Basically, you smack her down, it's got a little trigger, Pulls another cap up, works perfect. Um, so I use that to stick the new underlayment down. And then for shingles, and again, I wanted to do a metal roof, but they didn't have the end caps and the other trims in stock. It would have been like two weeks or so to get it. And I needed to get this roof on, so shingles it is. And they had these on sale uh, at Menards there, 26 bucks a bundle, which pretty darn cheap uh, they they advertise as super wide 42 inch format that sounds great unless you're an old out of shape guy like me and you're lugging them up a ladder yeah that reminds you how old you are <laughs> but uh we're almost done as you can see basically the shingles putting on with just an old rigid uh air nailer and these you cut in six inch increments, so there's no waste on a shingle on your starter rows. You know, because you go six, 12, 18, and then that leaves you with a, what, a 12 and a six or whatever. I don't know, I have the stack there to finish this off. So that goes pretty simple with these. Um, I used uh, a starter strip it's just a roll with adhesive backing, and then it has tar on, on the edges there. Uh, instead of flipping a shingle or, or cutting a shingle down, I just use that starter strip. And there is, but it's under this, because like I said before, I used, uh, I felt, put felt on this last year, but then it was way too long, and it was past, uh, expected date you know when you read the directions it said it was only good for 60 days so there is ice shield and water barrier but i just put this new felt on on top of the old stuff so i didn't put new uh another batch of that on so there is some it, it's just under this felt <laughs> i don't know if that's good or not but that's what it is uh and then i'm gonna add uh a vent here but I figured I'd wait till I got to the top to do it just for ease because I've never added a, a roof vent before. So 
I'm gonna wait till I get up there to mess with that. All right, I guess that's all I can really uh, talk about. I'll throw some some more shingles on and hopefully get this thing done today. But that's in a nutshell how I did my roof. Well, I got the upper roof finished off. I'll show you that, but before, I figured I'd show you my pretty sketchy ladder set up here. I got an eye hook screwed into a window header that's behind that house wrap, wrapped around this ladder, and that's not the sketchiest part. All right, let me walk over here. Look at the feet of this thing. <laughs> I carried 22 bundles of shingles up there at 78 pounds a piece. On this sketchy, sketchy setup, I guess I should say. All right, we went with the Owens Corning uh, ridge vent. Don't mind that big gob right there. I just, I didn't trust it. I didn't really like the, the vent. It seemed cheap and chintzy. Of course, you know, with my clay soil, just walking down the driveway to get over here, I left footprints all over, but what are you gonna do? It, it is what it is clay is just part of this place so i started off i got the ridge and hip shingles all right so i pop for one pack of those which are nice and smooth go on nice and easy and i only use 20 feet of uh, ridge vent i know it'd probably look better if you went from pretty much one end to the other but uh i did the math and the calculations and i absolutely did not need 32 feet of ridge vent for my area you know the 20 feet is way more than enough all right so basically i went uh with the ridge and hip shingles and i run out because i only bought one pack and i had to finish her off with the regular shingles but no one will ever notice and the wind you know this way is north so I have all the shingles going that way, so you get a good winter storm, it's not gonna hurt any. But that's what she looks like. Not the, not the prettiest roof, not the ugliest roof, but hey, cheap labor, what are you gonna do? All right, we'll get on to the next project. Oh yes, mistakes were made. You see that pile of boards out there? I'm gonna try reusing most of them, I should be able to after I take the nails out and plane them down. But uh, since we decided to go with shingles on the roof instead of a metal roof, I pried them off and stuck some plywood up there. See that little gap? Yeah, less than ideal. But uh, I'll walk up there and I'll, I'll tell you about that. All right, here's the roof deck that I got up so far on the one side roof. It's obviously not completed. Uh, the main reason being that it's been raining now. It went from drought conditions to, like, monsoon conditions. And the ground is not very uh, optimal for setting a ladder on and hanging around 10 feet up in the air. But, uh, yeah, what I wanted to talk about on this roof deck is uh, if you're going to do a roof like this, I would recommend starting on the bottom and working your way up. I didn't even cut the rafter tails yet. That's why I started on the top. But basically, my issue ended up being that my building isn't completely square, so the sheets were off a little bit, and I had to cut almost every sheet to get it to square up after I ended up shoving the first set up tight against the building. And it just magnified and got worse as I went down. So my little tip on this, if you're doing the roof, roofing deck, would be to uh, start the sheets on the bottom and work up. Then you only got to, you can have them perfectly square, and you only got to cut when you get to the top. I know it's hard to believe a person would poke some sticks in the ground, build a building on top of it, and it not be perfectly square. But yeah, that's that's what happened. But uh, yeah, but because it's raining, this isn't the project I'm working on right now. So I'll take you down to what I'm actually working on. All right, I'm still working on these deck boards that are down on the lower level. 
Now, the reason I'm not done with them is it's not necessarily my favorite task. So every time I come up, I bring like a dozen boards, screw them down, and then call it good for the weekend on, on working on these deck boards. Uh, I only have one more board up here for me to install this weekend. But I figured I'd show you basically how I'm doing it. All right. Now, it's been raining, and yes, it's wet as heck there, and that looks horrible. But I'm thinking long term, once I had this roof completed and these walls up and that garbage gone and the ground graded a little better, of course, I'm going to add more, more soil so it's a better slope. It isn't a big drop off. But uh, I think that and the combination of gutters on the end of them, on the end of the roof, and I don't think I'll have a moisture problem under here. And that's going to be filled with gravel in there. But anyways, after rambling all that, I'm going to show you how I'm putting these boards on. All right, first thing I do is I drag my board over here. I look at the rings. Right now it's kind of smiling at me. The rings are going like this. So that means it's going to crown. And I try and put it so the crown is up. All right. And the first cut is easy. All right my square and I just mark a 45 on here if I get my pen to work cut that out all right now we pick the board up and we carry her down instead of where she's gonna go Pull her tight. And these things, you can pick the straightest boards on the shelf at Menards. They can be absolutely perfect. By the time you haul them home, they're not perfect no more. <laughs> so what I'm doing, I'm sticking my spacers in there. So after I cut my 45, I get it lined up on the one side. Nice, real nice to the edge. And then I go to the other side and I mark it. Now you may ask, well, why don't I just uh, measure and cut them all the same? Because my building isn't perfect, so it varies a little, just a hair, and I'm trying to keep it as close as possible. So the easiest method for me has been lining up to one side, taking my pen, going over to the other, and drawing a mark. All right, then after I get my mark, I wrestle it out of there. Cut that end off. All right, once she's lined up, three holes in there grab my old screw gun Now, with those three screws in, like this is loose, right? So I pull the spacer out on the other end so I can manipulate this end as tight as I want it. So now I can pull it tight. And basically I got this Craig jig, but I'm not using it as a direction state. So I'll show you what I'm doing. All right, I use the Craig bit. And you know you drill your drill your two holes in your slots and there's guides on this front of this jig that show you where to drill you basically just line it up with the two by six underneath but where I'm varying from the directions is instead of using uh, crank screws 
I'm just using uh, Menards two and a half inch deck screws. Now, why did I switch to these? One, I was having trouble finding the Craig screws. So then I was trying some camo screws and those were working okay. Maybe not, not up to par with the Craig ones. But even the Craig ones, I was having trouble sucking the board tight. Where these, yes, they're a little more visible, but the hole's still on the side. But these really suck the board down good. And I like that because I don't want squeaks and creaks and everything else as I'm walking across this. Because that would bother me the rest of my day. And I just screw them in. And as I go down, like I will screw this one, this one, keeping this gap perfect with this. And then I will go all the way to the end and I will pump three screws in and set the gap at the very end. So then the only place my gap will vary will be between this board and the very end. And it's only going to be tighter. It's not going to vary by being wider. All right. So, at least that's the way it's been working so far. All right, that's simple enough. There's a few things that uh, I discovered that was kind of interesting to me. I don't have the numbers written down anymore, do I? But, like, as I was cutting the angles where they get smaller, God, it's been a couple weeks. But uh, I know it's a mess. It's a mess. There's, there's construction and progress here. But one thing I thought was kind of cool was each board, I want to say it was like, say, 11 and 3 quarters of an inch. I'm picking a number out of thin air, but that number sounds familiar to me. But each board got like 11 and 3 quarters of an inch longer than the next one with the gaps I'm using. So there's definitely a mathematical formula if you're doing a deck with the boards angled to get your lengths. But it really only works if your stuff's perfectly square. And I actually was pretty good for square in that first section for sure. But, you know, stuff started to vary a little here and there. And these edges, no, the boards don't line up perfect. But I'm not exactly concerned on that because I'm going to stick a piece of angle aluminum or maybe angle iron, whichever I... Uh, get my greasy mitts on and I'm going to screw that down over those edges just to kind of define the edge and less chance of chipping out the wood and I think long term I don't think it'll be a tripping hazard I think long term that'll work out okay now you may be looking going that is one homely set of bottom stairs well the reason that is I ended up reusing some stringers I had I, when I first originally made stringers for this building, uh, what I did is I looked on the Menard site and I seen their rise and run and they only had one, right? The, the stringers they had in stock all had the same rise run ratio or whatever you, you'd call that formula. So that's what I made a set of stringers at. And when I went to put them up there, <laughs> it was gonna be way too high you would have hit your head it was it wouldn't have worked at all so i had to do my own custom rise run over there but i had already pre-cut a set of stringers so i chopped that down and i used it here and unfortunately it was going to be an inch and a half short of hitting the ground so now it has like a little uh spacer block there so just that first step is an inch and a half taller than the rest but i've been uh chugging up and down there and i haven't uh, had any issues yet and if you're wondering why there's gaps on the side here uh that'll be in another video but uh basically it's wide enough for a two by four because my thoughts is i'm going to run a two by four up on an angle to make my railings so it'll, well i'll cover that in another video but there's a reason for those gaps on the edges all right i'll get this screwed down and that's my last board of decking. So then uh, maybe we can try out this mud. I mean, I don't know. We'll, whoa, camera, what are you doing?
Will the ladder sit in this? I don't know. Pretty mucky. Hmm. Time will tell. On today's episode of Innovative Products, we bring you the ladder sled. For use in especially clay conditions, this innovative product is brought to you by Dumb Ways to Die Redneck Industries. All right, got clay soil, it's wet, it's muddy, don't feel safe on the ladder? Try the Redneck Ladder Sled. Now, as an addition for free, if you have the clay soil, you step around in it and the clay will hook the ladder rungs. You used to need three points of contact, but now look at me, it's like I'm glued. The only thing you gotta be careful of is do not go under the ladder, because that will bring you bad luck. You do not need bad luck while you were up cutting your rafters off. Oh, the ladder's in the way. Well, oh, come on, baby. <laughs> They tell you never to reach while you're on the ladder. Well, when you have the rat redneck ladder sled, I mean, the ladder is so sturdy, man, reach away. Plant them clay feet in the rung. Now that it's hard to beat. That is like a sore dink. Hard to beat. All right, I got a good start on uh, first level roof and I'll break down the anatomy of what I did here. Basically, I, I was planning on a metal roof so I had to rip the boards I had for the metal roof off. And then I put plywood down, the underlayment, I shingled it and then the one part where it got kind of tricky for me was the metal up against the building. I bought the cheap, flimsy aluminum flashing they have at Menards. And man, I was not good at working with that stuff. Uh, basically, I used black pole barn screws with a little rubber washer. And I cut like a 12 foot section of that flashing, screw it down. And then I tried to force it up against the building. And... Then I used roofing nails to attach it to the building. And I got a bead of uh, roofing cement underneath it before I laid it down. So that made the whole thing even more tricky because it's all gobby and gooey, you know, as you're working. But man, that stuff is flimsy. And then after I got it attached, I laid a board up here and so I won't get spray paint on my shingles. And I spray bombed it black so it uh, kind of blended in. And the only reason I did that is, you know, it's significantly cheaper than buying the colored metal. Although if I were to do it again, I would probably pop extra money to buy a little thicker metal just because this was due to my lack of skill and uh, experience with it. This turned out pretty homely. But the one bright spot in that it turned out homely is the only spot you can see it is standing out here on this roof. When you're standing down on the ground, you can't see it. And when you're looking out the windows, you can't see it. So that is what it is. And when I got to the corners, I just cut a small piece, bent it in the middle using a two by four to kind of give it a seam, make a nice little angle, nailed it on over the other piece. And I uh, put uh, the seam tape over the top of it. I don't know, will that hold? I don't know, I hope so. You know, I. Probably if a guy did it right, he would probably have his house wrap go over that But you know I You got to do what you got to do. I don't have no more house wrap here and uh, You know if I rip it off, I'm gonna have a bunch of holes in the house wrap. So I did what I thought was best All right, and then from there We're working up onto the siding So my wife cut this and stained it And I'm starting to screw it on Basically, you know, that way, is, that way is north. So uh, 
we put the screws on that side and then there's going to be a batten so there's only one screw well three screws in each board but only on the north side of the board and then a batten is going to go in here and it's going to cover up the screw and it's going to pinch the other board down so uh that's basically how we're doing that and we got half inch boards and they ain't very pretty i just run them off the sawmill i didn't even really square them up but they're half inch boards just to space it off the house wrap so these boards can kind of dry out a little bit and on the bottom of them i cut uh a 45 so water would drip off and i left like an inch and a half gap to the bottom roof you know i i don't know i'm winging it never done this before so that's how we did that and then let's see i i talked about earlier i got my soft vents and i got them all in um i got the fascia and man i'm not very good at that either it but hopefully by the time i get done with this building you know it's it's a little wavy i don't know if it's showing up on the camera but it looks like Lake Superior out there. She's She's got some waves in her. <laughs> but, you know, you got to learn somehow. And for my D uh, trim on the roof, you know, where I joined it, I just rammed a, a pole barn screw in after I got this trim on. And I'm going to dab a little touch-up paint on there. And I, I don't think that'll look too bad. I'm not sure what the proper way to do it is, but that's how I did her. All right, and then the other thing, we slapped in these windows. These are the Menards Gel Dwend windows. And man, you kind of get what you pay for. Um, well, first, I'll, I'll go in, I'll show you that. But uh, I use uh, window seal flashing, basically, like my metal. This piece of metal comes in and it actually folds over the sill and the window. And then, basically, I just started the flashing on the bottom went up and you know hopefully sealed her off and then if this flashing even though it's brand new it didn't seem to stick that good so i used some of the house wrap tape on the edges of it and hopefully that just hopefully it keeps there i mean it wasn't falling off or anything it just didn't seem like like it was glued down tight i don't know if it's needs to get warm and kind of melt on or how it works but I was worried about it coming off, so that's why you see the block at uh, seam tape on all the edges. All right, now let me show you my complaint about these windows. <clears throat> now, yes, I understand you get what you pay for, but a window, I mean, in the very least, Oh, I'm, I'm stepping on that high-quality flashing that unrolled. See how flimsy that is? I guess that surprised me. I thought it would be thicker, but... Anyhow, back to what I was talking about, short attention span. Look at these screens, man. And that's that's where it's supposed to be. You know, that's, that's where it's supposed to clip in. I mean, a skeeter can fly right through there. I mean, yeah. That's, uh... Definitely, you get what you pay for, but I expect it a little better than that. And if you're thinking, well, that window, that's a fluke. Ooh, look at that little guy. Kind of cute. But uh, this is the other window, and it's even got a different style kind of screen grab in there. The other one had little pins you pull. But look at these uh, gaps. I don't know. And, and the top. I mean, yeah, it's a cheap window, but man, you know. You'd expect it to at least seal. But, uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, on to the next part. All right, for the back, we got these beautiful boards. Nice 12-inch white pine boards. Um, they were cut on the bandsaw mill. I actually sanded the front of these, and then we left the back rough, and then we pre-stained it, pre-drilled all the holes so all of our screws will line up real nice. And like on the back, we're using these 12 inches. On the rest of the building, there'll be all kinds of different sizes because I only had so many of these that I could use. So when I put them up, I got uh, some Z trim down here 
and I'm spacering these up off of their quarter inch with these two spacers. So basically I just hold her up there. Bang, boom, smash. Push her tight. Try not to drop your spacers. All right. Now I do go through and like every other one, I'll use the level, make sure they're going level. Because if you do it at every board or every other one, you can manage a gap, you know, if, if it's starting to get off. It's way easier to correct it a little bit over time than get five boards down the roll and then you're just, you got an ugly gap. And it seems on these, like if you're using spacers, I usually start one row of screws up because when I start on the bottom, a lot of times it makes my spaces fall out. I think it's the screw hitting the Z trim or something and pushing the board out a little bit. I don't know. All right, I'll get these screwed on. And then, uh, you know what would look good in that hole? A window. And we just happened to have one. Basically, we figured we needed some light on the back part of this because our stairs are here. So we put two two by fours in to kind of create a framing. And the gap between those boards was 24 inches. And Menards just happened to have a 24 by 24 utility window for 40 bucks. Let's go take a look at it. Now we first originally were thinking of making plexiglass windows or whatnot because this isn't a conditioned space. It's just a barn, a lower barn area. But uh, for the $40 for this utility window, I mean, I can't make nothing for that. So I, I don't know how they make that window for that and uh, sell it and make money. But uh, the quality of this window, even though this is like their lowest grade, utility window is better than the windows we bought for upstairs that were five times the price of this so you know menards you know it's it's a crap shoot but basically i'm thinking i'm just gonna shove her in the hole screw her down and i don't think i'm gonna use any like seal tape or anything like that we did paint where we cut the boards you know so we'll try and keep moisture from wicking into the boards kind of sealed them up a little bit there but I think the only seal job I'll do is after we get it in, I haven't made it yet, but I'm going to put black trim around it, you know, just cut boards, paint them black and put it around the window. <laughs> and I may just run a bead of silicone around that black trim. That won't be today, but today we'll put this window in. So let's see if it fits. All right. What do you think? What are the odds on it fitting? Ooh, like a glove. A little bit of space, not too bad. Alright. We'll try to avoid dropping this thing. I think we will screw it in right here. Wow, this gets a little tricky. You know, if the earth wasn't so crooked, it wouldn't be so hard to level this stuff, right? All right, we'll get a second screw in there just for fun. I know it takes all the excitement out of it, but uh, there, that could handle a Cat 5 hurricane. All right, I'll get the rest of these screws in and then maybe I'll make the trim. Nah, I'm not going to make the trim today, but we'll get the rest of the screws in and next time we'll make the trim, you know, maybe I'll. I got a bunch more to do so maybe I'll make all the trim at once 
try and be efficient, do it factory style. I don't know if I talked too much about these boards. Uh, these we plane down to three quarters of an inch and uh, basically I snapped a chalk line and I haven't even really been using the level anymore. I just make sure the tops lined up with the chalk line and we got a little 45 cut on the bottom so the water drips off. And for like the holes, because we're obviously making a million of these things. So basically I have one I use as a template and then it doesn't matter the width of the board. You put two boards side by side, your template one in front, and you set them on a flat surface. And even if the other boards only goes to here, when you drill these bottom holes, when you drill through here into it, you know, you're getting this spacing on this side. Then you flip the other board over so the other side is flat on the ground. And then, you know, you, can, you got perfect spot for your holes again. So it doesn't matter the thickness of the second board. You can always get the holes three quarters of an inch in and three quarters of an inch down, like say for this hole, as long as you're holding the, the boards together nice and tight. But we're basically putting this on for something for splash and dirt and because it seems this clay soil stains everything. Whoa, look, I put a fancy little star mark in there. I'm not even going to charge extra for that. It seems this clay uh, soil stains everything, and I didn't want the bottom of our boards being all stained up. And then if they, they rot or whatever from being closer to the moisture and the stuff from the ground, the, this is a lot easier to replace. Or if some guy bangs it with a tractor or something, I don't know who would do that. But... Uh, Basically, we uh, put them on, and then we put uh, some Z-trim on there. I'll go grab some of that. All right, this is the Z-trim I bought at Menards. This is what it looks like. Um, it's, you can have any color you want as long as it's brown, because I believe that was the only color they had. Uh, basically, I just set it on there, and I nail it up with roofing nails. This one, I know it's a hack job, but uh, I... I notch it and then bend this over so I can go around the corner and still have the, the brown spot or the, the metal go all the way to the end, the brown spot. That doesn't sound good. But basically just set her up, nail her on. Um, looks isn't really, because uh, most of this is going to be covered by the, the siding. So it's not, not a huge deal. But a person still wants to do a quality job. I mean, I... I'm amazed I watch people's YouTube videos and how fast they build stuff. You know, granted this, uh, what you need to do is buy real little nails. So the only way you can nail them in is by smashing your fingers. But anyhow, I'm amazed how fast people build stuff on YouTube. Because this kind of caught me by surprise how long it's taken. But you figure a guy's cutting a tree down. All right, you're milling the boards on the sawmill. You're stacking and stickering them, letting them dry. And then you're taking them and you're planing them with the planer to get an even thickness. You're re-ripping them if, if they're, they bowed or went crooked at all. And then you're uh, like drilling holes in them, sanding them, painting them, and then finally putting them up. So the actual smallest part of time on this building and that's why I haven't been making that many videos is actually working on the building I have so much time into sanding boards and planing boards and painting boards and you really just can't do that uh, good of a video and I'm no all right it's about time to wrap her up so I'm going to take one last look at where the building sits right now you know, we just had a week off, me and my wife up here, and basically we did the top roof, and we did one side roof, and we started doing some of that siding. I actually got some of the battens on. From the ground, it don't look too bad. And we got the two windows in. You know, some of the non-sexy stuff, like uh, putting the house wrap on up there, which, which is always sketchy. 
you know that's on even ground and I ratchet strap I put one more tier on that scaffolding and I ratchet strap it to the building to try and keep me safe my metal work isn't uh, <laughs> that good I've never ever in my life used that metal trim before and that's a learning experience and when I got to the top I had no idea because I got that uh, what do you call it the board that the rafters go on that that center board you know it sticks out I'm gonna paint it black obviously once I crawl back up there to do the the siding but uh, yeah so next time because there's gonna be a window right here in this wall the holes there it's just covered with house wrap next time hopefully I can get that on and that other roof so that's what the inside looks like with the boards on the back you know I think that looks pretty good and with those gaps I guess I don't know if I need battens or not you know it is a barn I want a little airflow and a few drops of water that get through there it's probably trivial um, we're probably gonna enclose these stairs but one more thing that we worked up excuse me worked on this week but I didn't get any footage of it because it was raining um, we're playing with this this is kind of a weird wall you know because it's inside but yet it's an outside wall you know there's unconditioned air out here so we house wrapped it and then we're doing half inch uh, pieces of white pine and I'm cutting them at an angle and then I thought I would do a strip right down where they meet you know a beveled half inch piece you know a half inch thick maybe one inch wide and bevel the edges and then go up to hide the seam I think that'll look pretty slick um, we got a door in and we didn't get any footage of that this just because it was raining and it was so loud on the roof and then it was so dark in here nothing was really showing up on the camera so in here basically we built the first wall and the door I didn't have any shims how do you buy a door and not get shims but uh, yeah that's what I did so I wanted the door in so we jammed some chunks of wood we had laying around in here so when I get shims I'll adjust that uh, the gap around it to make it look better but uh, it ain't too bad it ain't too far off but it's not perfect so basically this will be the first insulated wall and over here over the stairs we got our cubby and in there there's going to be a 30 gallon water tank a pressure tank the on-demand water heater um, just basically utilities and then the next tier up is going to be like a hidden storage you know like a cubby that uh, isn't going to look like it's there so stuff we'll put there will be uh, stuff we want hidden I guess <laughs> all right uh, I think that's about all we can do for uh, this weekend so now I got to go through and clean up and go weed the garden here I'll walk you over and I'll show you because I talk about uh, the sunflowers in the garden and I never really show it now here's one patch of our sunflowers we have four different patches this one's on the side of the hill the ground is actually fairly level it's just they grew up you know all wavy and the reason they're planted so thick is we had a horrible spell with no rain all right so I planted I came up about two and a half weeks later and not a single thing had sprouted so I was like ah oh, man you know maybe it uh, maybe it ain't gonna take because you know no rain obviously so I threw a few more seeds on kind of tilled it in again and then it rained and it we had almost rained too much everything turned into soup <laughs> but uh, we, we really needed the rain the ground sucked it up and all this popped up so yeah they're planted uh, way too thick and the grass and that that's growing up in there that's really no concern because once these sunflowers start growing pretty much everything underneath them dies so you don't really have to stuff doesn't really compete with them very good so because they come in so thick usually I don't but on this patch I'm probably gonna throw some either 10 10 10 or uh, even maybe some urea in here try and feed them because you can see how they're kind of light green if you throw like urea in here then they uh, turn nice and dark green and they really shoot up 
and even with them being over planted like this i've had luck with it you know not looking too shabby you know if they still get like four or five feet tall and get the flowers on so so there's hope for this all right i'll go show you the garden all right here's our little garden now this the one thing that surprises me about this we had that drought obviously and then we had two hard frosts and we had already stuck in our pumpkin plants and some of the other plants but the pumpkins were probably the biggest plants that we had in the garden at the time i mean the frost was so hard we had a pail with water in and there was a quarter inch of ice in the pail and the leaves pretty much turned black shriveled up on the pumpkins and i just thought they were done i thought they were done with and the next week we come back and they were growing new leaves i guess i didn't even know that that would happen but uh yeah so that that worked out great i mean some of the stuff here isn't as good as it could be because of that drought and we don't water you know it's too much work if we water we got to go over there's a ditch over there and i dig water out of there or there's a creek but that's further back and i bring it over in pails you know that's how we got to water right now so we don't water basically all we do is kind of weed this and hope it rains so this batch of corn is doing pretty good we got seedless watermelons so and then they had when you plant the seedless watermelons you had to throw one different one in for a pollinator that that's what it said for the directions that's why it looks like two different kinds but we've never tried those in the past so we'll see how they turn out you know i don't know the plants are a lot sicklier looking than uh <laughs> and years prior when we planted regular watermelons but like you plant the bush baby watermelons and stuff you get so many darn seeds you know so we're, we're trying something different here we got some cucumbers some more corn you know some doing better than others a couple different kinds of beans and tomatoes now if that isn't as homemade as it gets basically i took coat hangers and I'm trying it out to see if I like it, right? I took some coat hangers, drilled a hole in a stake, bent the coat hanger part in, and put it through the hole. And we'll see. We'll see if that can hold them up. I only put a couple in just because uh, I wasn't sure whether I was going to like it or if it was going to work. But we're trying that out on some of our uh, tomatoes. So we got a little variety and i guess every year it amazes me because we don't this corn down here we planted pretty darn late just as an experiment and it was kind of in the middle of the drought so that made it even later yet at uh popping out so pretty much the stuff down on this end i don't know i don't know if it's gonna have enough time but uh yeah it's fun to play around and then we got a few potatoes and we didn't even we didn't go buy seed potatoes or nothing we just cut chunks off taters we had in our in our cupboard at home and then some sunflowers and then that's supposed to be indian corn and that was actually planted right away it's just with the drought that didn't uh, come up and those are volunteer plants from from our stuff last year so that that drought kind of really screwed up the garden usually it's doing a lot better by now but uh you can only do what you can do all right this field uh yeah it's a little weedy but with the weather we've been having you know what what are you gonna do you know you can't mow it you're worried it'll die back so uh it is what it is but uh this is one of our clover fields primarily white clover but obviously you got some daisies and queen's Anne's lace or whatever you call that stuff but uh, the clover isn't doing too bad. I think if I could get in here and mow it in another couple weeks here, that should kick back some of them weeds. But uh, we'll have to see. I love this clover because like this field used to be, all, you see those willows back there? That's what this field was. It was all willows. And we spent the better part of the summer ripping willows out of fields, right? We just hook up a brush scrubber to them in the old pickup truck and me and the wife would yank them all out piled all the willows up burned them and that's how we got fields you know 
so and you know I was worried a lot of people told me the ground was gonna be too wet you know you got willows you ain't ever gonna be able to grow anything well yeah you know it's not very pretty right now but stuff's growing and you get a nice hard rain now with these clovers I, the the roots or whatever the clover does to the ground we don't really get big puddles here anymore but uh just wanted to show you that and then earlier this spring i showed you a, a field this was an old failed pond i want to say it was about four feet deep and it was just bottomless muck you know kind of like quicksand and we filled it in and we've been having trouble getting something to grow but uh a little love and some rain and a little luck and now we got a pretty decent stand of clover growing in there yeah there's grasses in there but i think this field will be ready to cut heck it's probably ready right now but i ain't got time but next time i'm up i'll probably cut this field and hopefully these clovers can just keep out competing that grass and get a little better quality of a stand of clover here so there's hope even when the ground looks looks horrible and it doesn't look like there's any hope there's hope you just got to keep trying well i guess that's all i can ramble on about for this week i guess thanks for watching have a good one